Oh, am I muted? Can you hear me? There we go. I can hear you now. Sorry. No worries. All right. Should we let everyone in? Yeah. Let's do it. Hey, everybody. Hello, everyone. So for the first few minutes, we just do chit chats uh, as we let people in. Uh, so anybody who wants to share threads, uh, ideas, just mention on chat. Um, I heard a lot of uh, Teach Me Anything sessions are already ongoing. Uh, so if you've had the chance to actually attend one and you had an opinion on that, or you want to thank somebody who took the effort to teach something, uh, you can do so now. Uh, any logistics types of questions that people have, uh, you can write down in the chat itself. We'll just wait maybe a few more minutes as is tradition to always start uh, late in classes. Fabian, do you know what the tradition at Stanford is? What is the rule? I know Berkeley is has a very fixed rule. Maybe Tyler, what's the Berkeley rule? Yeah, Berkeley, everything runs on Berkeley time, which means you show up 10 minutes late to everything. Okay. And that includes when you're hanging out with your friends. So everyone says, oh, we'll be there on Berkeley time. But then towards senior year, you get onto Berkeley time for Berkeley time. So you're 20 minutes late. <laughs> it's kind of bad. Okay, that's not what I meant. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe Fabian, I'm curious what the Stanford etiquette is. Do you want to unmute him, just Tyler? Yeah. Um, many, many years ago, before you were born, Manu, I yeah. was uh, gave a I was an acting assistant professor, step one at Berkeley, and there the rule was. Well, it was the, it was the opposite from Stanford. You either started ten minutes late or you finished. I can't remember. 10 minutes after the hour or 10 minutes before. And uh, I was giving a talk at Stanford and then I had to hightail it back to Berkeley to give a talk in the after, to give a class in the afternoon. And yes, I was 20, I, I was 20 minutes late. Uh, <laughs> luckily the uh, students were, uh, should we say, uh, uh, tolerant and uh, most of them were still there when I gave my talk. And uh, it was actually in fact the, the very first class I ever taught as, as a lecture series, so I was already quite nervous. Oh. <laughs> but I still made tenure, so uh, it wasn't all I bad. Um, yeah, I think usually one of the threads would be is uh, for people who are doing the Teach Me Anything class, just mention what time you want to attend and how sharply you'll start. Uh, similarly, for folks who will be sitting down in mentoring sessions, uh, please make sure that you can uh, uh, you can stick on time. And just as is tradition, are there any mentors uh, that are joining today that haven't had the chance to introduce themselves before? Um, I'm always curious, uh, folks that have not had that. I know, Julie, have you, is this the first time you're joining or, and then maybe Abdullah as well. Uh, maybe both of you could do just brief introductions. I'll randomly pick a few people in the classes because I know some of the backgrounds from many of you. Uh, and then we'll dive into logistics. So maybe uh, could you, Tyler, uh, unmute Abdullah for a second? And the purpose of this is I just want to share every time that just incredible groups of people are joining these classes from around the world and Discord is so impersonal, you might be talking to somebody and then behind that is a remarkable individual. So just for all of us to appreciate each other. Abdullah, do you wanna just briefly introduce yourself? Hello, good afternoon, maybe yours. And uh, I am almost morning here. So uh, hi everybody, I am Abdullah Shohail from Bangladesh, I am uh, teaching Yanganagar University uh, and doing some sorts of uh, research. I mean, actually, this frugal science, this idea is very new in this course. So uh, we actually uh, thought that we have this low-cost science that can afford uh, everyone. Uh, 
like uh, in our country, we can't afford uh, the high cost instrumentation or high cost research and so on. So, so uh, I was trying to do so. Uh, I'm basically plant biotechnologist. So, so many things uh, related to uh, plant science, uh, microbiology, uh, biochemistry, molecular biology. So, we used to do the low cost science to demonstrate or uh, to prove something. So, in this course, uh, I am uh, very, very, uh, I was excited to see when it's Google Science and Manu uh, sent me the link to join here. And lots of idea board. I am really amused that how much Google Science can do uh, all over the world. Uh, so, thanks everyone and thanks Manu uh, for being here. Tyler, of course, uh, thanks Tyler too, because Tyler is doing very hard. Every day he's uh, uh, replying to everyone, I think. Thanks all. Yeah, the logistics of this course is non-trivial. Um, okay, so we're gonna get started and we will start with logistics itself, which is the most important part of this class is building the teams. Uh, so if we all go to the Notion page for a second, and I'll try to share, I think, uh, by the end of this week, uh, it would be very important that we have all chosen a specific team. Uh, so maybe you can all have a show of hands. Just, I mean, I think there's around 140 people signed in. Uh, what percentage of folks have actually joined a team so far on the, uh, the Notion page? And for some of you who haven't seen the idea board recently, please do take a look. Uh, it's overwhelming, but on the other hand, uh, you know, challenges in this world are always overwhelming and there are many of them, uh, but then there are also many of us. So here is the Notion page. Please spend a few minutes on the idea board. And then maybe you could just do a rough show of hands uh, to see what percentage. I just wanna get an intuition of how many teams have already formed and how we should facilitate uh, team forming. Uh, so I'm only seeing around 15 people have raised hands. So uh, you'd have to do it virtually, sorry, for it to count. Uh, there is a button somewhere on Zoom uh, that you can raise hands, right, Tyler? Yeah, that's right. It should be under, uh, I think if you guys hit participants maybe, um, there should be a little virtual hand you can raise. Yeah, so if you just all go to participants and hit the virtual hands and then we could do a count and I'm seeing uh, only a small number of people have actually joined teams. Uh, so on the logistics front for this, one thing that would be valuable is uh, everybody should spend enough time on the idea boards, but then you don't have to work on the idea board that you have posted. Anything that you find interesting is complementary to your interests. Just write your name in the team. And then we would have sort of individual team meetings that you would all organize to introduce yourself this Wednesday. But I think it would be very valuable. And if you are really confused between two teams, you can talk to the two teams and then make your decisions. But I would much rather suggest to make a commitment to an idea. It's perfectly okay. Uh, if uh, you know, if you have to merge two ideas, uh, but it would be very valuable for us. I see 33 people have raised their hand, so there is roughly around 100 people that haven't joined teams so far. So, just as a background, if you all go here, I'll just share my screen for a second. So, if you go to the idea board, uh, and oh, and sorry, you may want to switch from table to um, the other view. Oh, this is perfect. This can be a quick Discord, uh, or sorry, a quick Notion what just uh, tutorial. <laughs> so we just, so there are multiple views we can have on uh, this idea board. Right now we're looking at the board view, which is probably the one we want, uh, because now you can see everything laid out like this. There's also a table view, which is different. Um, and then I think one thing of value would be is, as we discussed in our uh, design sessions of what a good idea board is, uh, but seems like, so this is a good example. There's already a team around it uh, on antimicrobial activity and capacity of plant extracts. And one of the notions that the next step that we do 
is also based on the needs of the teams, uh, we would also assign a mentor in that space. So since people are looking at plant extracts, there might be mentors that are already in this group, but there is also mentors that we have access to outside this group itself. And so this is about antibiotic resistance. And then we can look at uh, some of the efforts in that space uh, and then assign a mentor as well more broadly. Uh, so I think I just wanna make sure that by uh, tomorrow, we all are able to at least assign uh, each one of us to a team and then we would do team meetings so that you all get to know each other better because the purpose of all of this is to work together and that's really when the real work will begin uh, and it can't happen. And this is also when the mentors can actually engage because currently the mentors are all on the sidelines uh, eager to engage, but we have to sort of have the teams be built uh, and since the idea boards are fairly clear, I think if somebody is finding it hard to join a team, just let me and Tyler know. And then we would suggest things based on your interest. Uh, there are certain sets of ideas that we might bench at this time if they don't have participants. Um, so any questions that people might have on this whole team building uh, context, please do uh, uh, mention that in your chat. Yeah, and, and real quick um, to that point. So the idea board, if uh, Manu, maybe could you go back to the idea board just so everyone knows exactly where to add their name to join a team? Yes. I think there's been some confusion around that. Um, so if you just click on any of them. This. Perfect. So we will also just walk through this a little bit. So you want to have a question. Can we design an extraction tool to replace uh, child labor from mica mines? It's an incredible, very deep, very uh, directed question. Uh, has the breadth of technologies that are needed all the way from chemistry to manufacturing to human rights. Uh, and then in here, there is this team. So there is this two team members that have already signed up. So if you're in general interested in this question, you would sign up here. And then it's also structured very well. There is a vignette, which is a much more, uh, uh, the specifics of the question. There is data that's associated with mining of mica. There is health issues. Uh, this is really written very well. And then there is a set of uh, links associated with this. Uh, so I think it would be very valuable is to just make sure that you get a chance to read through almost all of these idea boards before you make a choice. So I see a few chat questions that are associated with how to join teams. It really is driven by your passion for a question. I had not until today read this idea board and I read it and I feel like that's the team that I would join. Uh, it has the breadth of chemistry to social issues to scaling to capitalism everything mixed in and so i think you should choose uh and it doesn't have to be you should choose you don't have to choose an area that you've actually worked in in the past uh, and then with that in mind we will then assign and think about a mentor associated with this uh and you know in this mica context uh if we're looking at toxicity of mica mining and there is a few sets of people in this mentor group that have worked with arsenic poisoning and lead poisoning in environmental conditions. So they might be able to help and guide. If we don't find somebody uh, that's very specific, we will end up looking outside. But I think it would be very valuable if uh, teams can form. And roughly, we are thinking about something like at the least three people, but around five to six people. Uh, you know, beyond that, it gets a little bit hard on the logistics side. Um, um, and yeah. sorry, one last thing. So yeah, with that, I would say um, as soon as possible, if either you're on this right now or watching this lecture afterwards, as soon as possible, look through all the idea boards, choose one team that you want to do. This is going to be your final project team. Um, of course, there are always exceptions. If you're like, this is the worst, you can jump, but like this should be your final project team. Um, put your name in that team section. And if you can do that, then I will figure out nice structures so that you will build a discord channel that's private just for your team uh, so that you can set that up. Um, 
and, and organize all your meetings. But step one is you have to uh, put your name down for, for one team in particular that you want to join. Uh, and then I also am just fielding a question from a mentor on expectations from mentors. Uh, you know, I am just incredibly thankful for many of you to connect and join in. Uh, but the real action with mentors will happen when you engage with the teams and that uh, your commitment to that would just be dependent on how excited you might be personally about that project per se. Uh, and then I think from the folks that are engaging the mentors, it's going to be a function of uh, all of you being respectful of uh, their times and hence being on time and other factors. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, as a gathering uh, the first few sets, I think we're going to go through the five case studies. We're in case study two right now. Uh, we will do three more of these as examples. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's, it's valuable and uh, worthwhile seeing uh, people when they can join. Uh, but I think for mentors, you know, there is really no obligations except if you come and enjoy this time together with us. Uh, okay, so on that note, I want to get started. Uh, we are going to dive in into the topic for today, kind of finishing the case study uh, side of the story for compliant mechanisms. Uh, we discussed the idea board. Uh, Tyler, are you going to create the Google Sheet? So I think actually, given that we're doing this all on Notion, we're going to leave it on Notion just to reduce confusion. Um, and just to answer a couple, could I just jump in for very quick questions that people ask? Um, yeah. One is, I think Ruta said, if by Wednesday not enough people are in the team that you've joined, uh, will there be a time to join better form teams maybe by Friday? Um, yes, that's fine. Right. Um, we'll, we'll make sure that everyone is able to find a team. Um, and, and I'm sure there are going to still be lots of people that are going to be searching for a team. So uh, if you have like two people, that's probably okay. You can recruit someone else. Um, similar for if there are teams that are very large, uh, should they split? Uh, I would say for this week, don't worry about it. Have everyone in one group. And then you can ping me and say, hey, you know, we have 10 people, let's split. And we can manually split you guys. But for now, you'll each have your own channel. Um, and then last thing, uh, I think anyone, you know, do you think someone who doesn't do science for a living can be a good team member? Absolutely. I think as long as, yeah, again, everything is Legos. It's as long as you can think clearly, everything is very simple building blocks. If you can Google things uh, and, and think about things clearly, I think everyone can absolutely contribute in a huge way. I would, I would even stress that further to a point that it's actually extremely valuable to have people who don't just think like you to be in the teams. We are trying to solve not just technical problems, we're trying to solve problems that have a social context and an implication. And this will become very clear in the challenge that I'll talk about today. And also I'm reminded of first comment from the first class about the Amazon community just without that human centric approach, you know, you would not actually uh, discover those class of solutions. So please, the folks that don't have a official science training should be very sought after in this group because our role is to actually create solutions that people would use. And uh, you really need a very broad approach to this. Okay, so I wanna jump into uh, content for today. Uh, and I think I want to start with the assignment. Uh, so I'm assuming many of you have been able to at least do the deconstructions. Uh, I just wanted to share the page for what looks like to be a good assignment page. And again, this is all volunteer basis. You're not being graded on these assignments. But I found uh, Arani's RDT uh, deconstruction uh, quite fun. I don't know if you are here, Arani, on the call right now. Uh, we had asked to deconstruct a paper-based diagnostics. Uh, Arani ended up finding one. It was a pregnancy test uh, from an Indian market. It cost around 79 cents. Uh, there was a teardown. Uh, there was an idea board that was created. Uh, could we create RDTs without using plastic? I think it's an excellent idea. It would be phenomenal for us to actually explore it because RDTs are disposable it would be phenomenal to be thinking about uh, either mechanisms that have reusable and recycling involved after sterilization or other methods, just because literally hundreds of millions of these things are used around the world. Uh, and more so in the post-pandemic world, uh, these things would just be just like uh, 
the masks have become, these will become the symbol of society. It would be absolutely fantastic for one group to essentially create an idea board around this. Uh, one of the fun things that I immediately like about this is how well documented uh, this is. So you can see there is an art of photographing your work. It almost starts to look like, looks like Arani, you have made figures for papers before, uh, but it's valuable for all everybody when you're writing these documents to also just learn from how to document deconstruction. Um, and I think the two really fun things here, I'll just play this one quick video, uh, which is uh, he did open something and add a fluid to it. And as you will watch, uh, you're finally able to see the transport mechanism uh, that enables RDTs, which is this process of wicking. And now suddenly something very simple that Arani talks about in the very end comes about. By visualizing this, I don't know if many of you notice, it was 8x the time. So is the question that when you wait for an RDT, are you waiting for the kinetics of the biochemistry to happen? Or are you waiting for transport? That it just takes that long for transport to occur. And just it's clearly visualized in this picture here that the transport is not instantaneous and it does actually take some time. Uh, and then uh, what Arani does, just like a, a good post in the very end, he expands that to say, could we use better wicking materials? Uh, I really like this post. I think it would be fun for people to sort of share uh, and then keep and consider these as your own personal lab notebooks, essentially. Uh, okay, so I want to dive in into the topic for today. What we are going to try to cover is compliant mechanisms from a context of a case study. And this is a type of a case study where rather than showing you an incredible example in which a system like this has uh, uh, changed and made something dramatically accessible uh, globally, I'm going to give a few vignettes, but uh, this case study is much more about the promise of compliant mechanisms. Uh, and I found that exciting because I decided to choose a problem that I feel can be tackled with this, but as yet has not been tackled in the, the way that we might imagine. And that's going to come in the very end. Uh, but I want to do some basics uh, before. Uh, and this is uh, from the Precision Machine Design textbook from Alex. Um, several people had mentioned uh, how to quantitatively think about this idea of cost versus performance. Uh, so I found this example quite interesting because I had not given this example in a traditional sense before. So what you're looking at on the left is essentially a cost performance curve. I can make this a little bit bigger. Uh, and what you find are several technologies uh, for linear actuation. And since we will talk about voice coils in the very end, uh, this, uh, I like this quite a lot. Uh, and you can see this type of a hockey stick that's associated with this fact that uh, there is a performance that increases, but at certain set of a cost. Uh, and one of the perspectives is you really want to stay on these edges as far as possible before costs try taking off. But on the other hand, you want to be, uh, and so, you know, the examples here are, uh, these are lead screws. Uh, you can make a linear movement using lead screws. You can do better in performance with ball screws, but with an added cost. Uh, but then again, uh, from a perspective of even at a very high cost, there is a limit to a technology that will not give rise to a better performance. So you have to understand these asymptotes. And this is why uh, the course has a title science in it, because many times, even if you have not built it, you have the capacity to understand where a technology will asymptote. And hence, you should switch to another curve. Now, another curve right here is a linear motor, uh, highest in cost, uh, but then again, improves on the performance. And then comes voice coils, which really beat many of these technologies. And we will talk about voice coils in the very end a little bit. Uh, I love this example because it's just so uh, visual in many sense. And if you walk around products that you see, I mean, of course, there are limitations to voice coils from the travel direction. Uh, try finding these objects and see what performance was needed and why suddenly somebody made a choice between an actual 
a linear motor versus a lead screw versus a voice coil. It's a really valuable thread to do. Uh, another tool that I want to share from Alex's textbook, and in my mind, uh, I often joke that this is probably the most important thing I learned at MIT. Uh, I went to grad school there for almost, I was there total for 11 years, not all of them spent in grad school. And this one single slide to me is the most valuable thing I learned at MIT. And I'm very proud to say that because you know Alex taught me this, uh, which is his approach of Fred Park. Uh, I don't know the origin of where this comes from, and it's an organization scheme that allows you to organize your ideas. And this is exactly where you are in, in your idea boards, where we have an, a hint or an inkling of an idea. But the goal of this class is how do you apply a much more technical framework to rule out as many ideas as possible such that you're actually working on something that will have legs. So Fred Park stands for functional requirements. This in the cleanest possible number of words, you have to define what you are trying to do and what are the actual functional requirements. So this goes beyond the list of an idea. Uh, this would have to require that these are the sets of criteria that you have to meet for you to call it a success. And now this is personalized primarily because you are defining a success criteria. And this is what is often mistaken is that this is not something somebody else can give you because you might be choosing an audience that is dramatically different and hence you would have to have the capacity of being able to define this. Up the second key element is the design parameters. And this is when you, for the first time, introduce your idea. So the functional requirements need to be completely independent of the idea itself. And I think in design sessions, when I did some of the tutorials on Wednesdays last week, this was a very common mistake that I saw in almost many of the pitches where the problem that you wanna work on already had a hidden solution that you were thinking about. And it's very important in this framework to break it down so that when that idea doesn't work, you know you have several others uh, to play with. And so the design parameters can be very specific. This would be any number of ideas that you have. They will each have some design parameters, but it's important to note that you would break them down and eventually you have to choose one. Uh, analysis is obvious. This is what can you do on pencil, paper, equations, computer, before you ever build anything. Most electrical engineers will analyze their circuits ever before soldering anything. Most, pro I mean, I guess programmers <laughs> by design are doing analysis, but they are thinking about the mathematical framework beforehand. Most mechanical engineers nowadays will do some amount of calculations before you build anything. So I think this is a piece that's important to learn. And for most of the class, uh, I feel if we were, for your projects, if you spent majority of your time here, this is perfectly okay. Uh, of course, references is in the context of who cares, what is the scale of the problem. Uh, risk and countermeasures are obvious. I think you need to emphasize this early on and you can have multiple risks and multiple countermeasures. Uh, what I like about this framework is it is not about something that somebody requires me to do. It is not, you know, if you were in designing for a medical device, a framework like this might be required. But I utilize this framework to prune out ideas. So this is why I like this is that when nobody tells me to do this, I still do this in the back of my head. And this is why uh, it's a very useful tool from an engineering perspective. And there are many variations of it, but every single time I often find uh, this particular framework works very well. You want to do this on a physical or a large sheet or an Excel sheet where you do write things down. And I think for every project, I will be requesting people to try to play with this. So I wanted to introduce this before we dive in into uh, today's class. Uh, okay, so I think we are going to do a quick, uh, a quick demo. Uh, so today's class is about uh, where have compliant mechanisms changed the world or have they changed the world? And uh, I'm gonna ask you if, uh, how many of you have played with Lego? Uh, this to me is probably in my favorite patent. 
the title is Toy Building Brick. It was written and filed in 1958, I think granted around 1961. And here is a very simple figure. And I am wondering if some of you have actually thought about this a little more deeply. So uh, if you happen to have a Lego brick around you, just go pick it up. So I happen to have one. Uh, I should have mentioned it before. Uh, there is something quite subtle about this object that is so mundane in some sense. Uh, and many of you might have thought about this. Uh, so I'm hearing a few of you happen to have, if you happen to have a Lego brick, it really is worth it for you to go pick it up, even if it takes a minute. Uh, but if you don't, then uh, you, know, you can uh, keep watching uh, the stream. Uh, so I first want you to observe uh, two things. Of course, the pattern talks about nubs and something that the nubs go in. Uh, but there is, there is something quite remarkable about this object. I mean, of course, it's made with injection molding and we will talk about how precise this object is. Uh, but I'm curious if in the chat or if anybody wants to say is, if I take these two objects and I snap them together, what is the precision of this alignment? It's a very simple question. Uh, when two bricks align together to each other, from a coordinate system perspective, how precisely have I snapped a Lego block? And this is at the heart of how Lego actually works. Uh, because you are building things out of hundreds and hundreds of objects. So I'm just going to show, for example, uh, I was looking through to find what is the largest object that has ever been made with Lego. And I was shocked to see uh, this is a tower uh, made out of Lego bricks in Israel. Uh, but this tower is, is quite remarkable because as you add pieces, uh, the theory of errors works like this, that when you put two pieces together, if there is any amount of error between piece one and piece two, when you add the third piece, now the error is adding up. So if there is an error in the x-axis, suddenly there is another error. And so as you start building with larger and larger blocks, at some time, these blocks should not be able to snap together. But I have never in my life playing with Lego, making large structures or anything, ever had that challenge that I am stuck with uh, this object not snapping together. Uh, so. I am curious if people have, uh, before I tell you the answers, uh, I'm curious for people who have this block in their hand, you can take a look uh, and try to guess, uh, you know, this all works because of compliance and the principle of kinematic coupling. So we'll talk about that briefly, but take a look at the circle and the location that the circle goes in. And the question is, how many contact points do you think every one of these circles has when I snap this together. So the question is, if I have a brick like this and I have a plate like this and I have snapped it together, how many total contact points are here? So you can do that first by just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There are eight nubs in this. So this is a little bit of a quiz. How many actual contact points when you snap two of these things together? And you know, one thing that I'm interested in is literally this design. So you can just briefly take a look at these ridges. There is something quite special about these ridges. And I'm curious if any of you even ever noticed that Lego blocks had ridges inside. Uh, these ridges is what makes it work. And when a circular piece is going to fit here, for example, uh, the question is how many contact points there might be. So yeah, I see Eves has an answer, it's three. So when you connect this block to another block, the total number of contacts that you've actually generated is the number of nubs you have multiplied by three. And that is a classic example of an over-constrained design. Because for two objects to be uh, 
perfectly constrained. There are only six degrees of freedom, so there should only be six degrees of contact points that can precisely. Uh, and so now there is over constraining. And because of compliance of these two structures and the tolerances that you would build and design, uh, many of the errors will essentially cancel out in a manner that you get an extremely precise fit. Uh, and this was a question uh, scientifically asked, uh, you know, interestingly, not by Lego, but by Alex himself in one of his books and his, uh, one of his graduate students, uh, uh, Weber. Uh, so the first thing, which is not so surprising, you know, the manufacturing tolerance of almost all injection molded parts, uh, you know, this, you can make them around 30 microns or so in precision. So if you were to take a micrometer and measure different bricks of Lego bricks, same part, but made at different types, they are precise to, you know, 20 microns, which is pretty interesting, but that is a very standard in this technology. But when you snap them together, I absolutely love this paper uh, that Alex wrote. Uh, it is the context of elastic averaging. Uh, they took Lego blocks and they snapped them on top of each other over and over and over again. Uh, and they asked how precisely were they able to essentially snap them every single time. And uh, there is a hidden sentence in that paper that doesn't get the a clothes that it, uh, you know, this is why Lego is amazing. It states, first, the position of the blocks was taken with a coordinate measurement machine. Coordinate measurement machine cost around $100,000. It is the most precise machines industrially that are available uh, that allow you to measure uh, essentially a coordinate of a given point. So if you made something and you wanted to measure its geometry, you would use them. And the sentence is, uh, but the Lego blocks were found to be more repeatable than the CMM. And uh, what they discovered was the fact that this approach will not work if you want to measure the precision and tolerance of these objects. Uh, and of course, they did this for thousands and thousands of cycles because you're also talking about hysteresis and many other changes that might happen. And, you know, in terms of ballpark numbers, uh, the thread that you can start exploring uh, as you start putting Lego blicks together, something very interesting happens. So first of all, if there is only one nub, the kind of numbers are, uh, you know, you can get snap-on fits with this type of a precision order of two, one to two microns, uh, which is quite remarkable for just, you know, two pieces snapping back together. Uh, but the magic of kinematic coupling and compliance here is that in this situation, as you increase the number of contact points, the error actually goes down, which is quite interesting. So what you're looking at in this table in this experiment done literally on some Lego blocks is with two blocks snapping together that had 72 contact points, the repeatability was roughly around you know, eight microns. But then when you have five blocks with 180 contact points, you only have a 2.8 microns. So seemingly, it, it feels a little counterintuitive, but what is happening is that the random errors are elastically averaging themselves out to build a more and more and precise structure by an over-constrained design. So normally, this is not how you would design anything in uh, precision machine design. You wouldn't over constrain your system. That would be very bad for many reasons. But because of elastic averaging and the choice of these materials and properties, you end up building something that is far more precise. And the more pieces you add, the more precise your object becomes. And to me, this is the first example of an object, you know, if without this trick, Lego would not have captured the kind of market it captured. And of course, Lego's patents have expired. And after that time, many other companies utilize the same trick. Uh, it would be fun and worthwhile if many of you are thinking about precision machines. And of course, there are many projects that have been started in optics where people have been thinking about using literally Lego as their basis 
for building optical instruments, primarily because of some of the precision that you get uh, fairly easily. Uh, there are limitations to this, but on the other hand, uh, it is a very versatile material to play with. Uh, and unfortunately, in the early days, Lego used to be expensive because of patents. Currently, I don't understand why Lego is expensive. So for many of you who are in the education space, it is worthwhile also to be thinking about, uh, you know, what is an affordable Lego for that matter? Uh, you know, when I grew up, I didn't have access to this object, uh, although I know I would have enjoyed it. I only uh, learned about it for the first time in college. And that's precisely because many of you who are joining from far around the world know this reality, that this wonderful object is not accessible. So another thought for an idea board uh, to be thinking about. Uh, and I'll post this paper. It's quite a fun paper for people to learn about how to make measurements in the context of precision machine design as well. Um, and there are several tricks that you use, including capacitive sensing. Uh, and uh, if some of you are thinking about measuring displacements very precisely, uh, the tricks of capacitive sensing are very, very valuable uh, because of uh, how precise they are for very little cost. Um, so to close this, uh, this world on kinematic couplings, historically, this goes back to uh, Lord Kelvin and Maxwell, uh, two uh, ideas that came about who were the first group of people who were building precision machine designs and proposed this idea. Uh, there is fundamentally something very different between what Kelvin proposed and what Maxwell proposed. Uh, Kelvin's design had three different kinds of, so now this is a generalized way of thinking about what was happening when they would get three contact points in these nubs is whenever you are trying to build and align something that needs to be precise, uh, you take just ball bearings or hemispheres and you make trapezoidal grooves and you can immediately see that every one of the sphere will contact the groove at two points. And hence, when you add this up, this is two plus two plus two, that's six, that gives you a completely uh, correctly constrained uh, map. In Kelvin's kinematic coupling, the design is slightly different. There is a groove, there is a trapezoid, and then there is a flat disc. And the way he designed his kinematic couplings were based on three plus two plus one. A flat disc contacts a hemisphere only at one point, a groove contacts at two points, and then this trapezoid geometry would contact at three points. So it's, it's a valuable, trick to learn if you are trying to build something precise in the machine shop, uh, just primarily some simple machining and uh, ball bearings uh, give you, you know, you can fairly easily with these tools uh, get alignments that are sub-micrometer over very repeatable long-term. And I think several folks, including Fabian and other folks who have pushed on the fundamental limits of alignment uh, you know, also realize the limitations of uh, these sets of ideas. Uh, maybe actually, uh, it might be, this is a good time uh, if Fabian, you wanna mention uh, the ideas from the thermal alignment of wafers and how far, you know, going from kinematics to what technologies did you all develop to get to nanometer scale alignment, for example. Do you wanna say a word or two about uh, the, the uh, um, alignment it might be better if i had a little more time to come up with a diagram but um interferometry i'm not sure how that coordinate measuring machine works but um the laser interferometer interferometers of course predated the laser but the laser made interferometers work over huge distances and uh uh, it was um, an MIT graduate uh, with the curious name of Euclid Moon. Did you know Professor Moon? Oh, uh, well, this was his son. Uh -huh. And uh, he had come up with essentially an interference microscope, very cheap one. And uh, we were, and with that, you could measure down to a few nanometers. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can do a similar thing with the Moiré technique too, where you have two gratings, and I'm sure you're familiar with that too. 
Uh, and then we um, used the microchannel heat sink array. We had an array of heat sinks that could in fact do two dimensional distortion of the wafer. And I think this is the experiment you saw. Yes. So indeed, although I didn't have formal training uh, as a mechanical engineer, I was near enough to those who did to be able to, I think, pick up the essential points. And I like to think that's the point of this class. We're here to <laughs> learn from each other. And uh, uh, I'm certainly looking forward to uh, uh, getting our project going. Uh, and then Fabian, do you know what's, what was the, what were you able to achieve with the heat sink based alignment, which is much more of an active alignment? I didn't know that number. Yes, we were able to get down to uh, two nanometers. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think uh, Euclid was claiming he could do sub nanometer. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't say we ever claimed that, but it was quite remarkable because you could, without the feedback to the interference microscopes, um, excuse me, without, yes, that's right. He mm -hmm. was monitoring what was happening with it, with the feedback loop open. And yeah. you can see it wandering all over the place because of thermal variations of the air blowing around, uh, no matter how, try, how much we try to stop it. And as soon as you close the feedback, the thing just locked in. And uh, it was really exciting to see that happen. Uh, and I think uh, the thing that I want to emphasize and the reason I thought about, you know, kinematic couplings, of course, everybody uses, but this takes these sets of ideas of compliance to a whole another level. Because the whole reason the whole, the thermal mechanism for alignment works is of course, you're using temperature and temperature gradients for expansion of these materials, but at the scale of a few nanometers, and what's very powerful about this is that with fairly simple hardware, but very precise calculations, uh, you can achieve precision alignment that would not be possible without a traditional, uh, uh, with many of these traditional machine parts, for example. And then of course, the fact that it is dynamic uh, is all the more exciting uh, because then you could possibly uh, uh, modulate and change that over time as well. Uh, and then Fabian, are any of those uh, eventually, did they make it into lithography instruments? Is that, what's the, oh, I think Fabian, you're muted. Yes, I'm just curious, yes. commercially, yes. where is the state of the art of alignment? <laughs> um, we are, they are down to about a nanometer or better now, uh, using interferometric techniques. There's, now I use two different words. One is alignment, which is the active part of getting what I call overlay precision. Uh, so Canon, well, have you come across the technique of nano imprinting? Mm -hmm. In, uh, it's a form of embossing, mm -hmm. and Steve Chow uh, came up with this back in age, uh, 96 when he was at Minnesota and discovered that you could in fact uh, just use mechanical imprinting could print 10 nanometer features. Mm -hmm. And uh, that created a lot of excitement and I think got him a professorship at Princeton. Mm -hmm. And uh, two companies were formed, uh, one his own and another uh, by Grant Wilson, who's mostly famous for the chemically amplified resist. And it was Grant Wilson's company called, uh, I think, uh, Molecular Imprints that then uh, uh, made a deal with Canon. And Canon, I'm told, were using this interferometric uh, uh, alignment technique to get sort of the one nanometer overlay precision that we're talking about. Uh, I've been rambling. What was the question? Yeah, no, I think the, the question really was about what the, uh, what the precision ended up being in those sets of instruments. Uh, the current, uh, the current wafer aligners, for example, I'm just curious what the, what the fundamental limits right now are in wafer alignment, which is a common place where, you know, an idea like this, where I want to align two objects next to each other meets its ultimate, uh, you know, when you have multi-layer systems. 
I, I'm out of touch with what the latest is. I can certainly know who to ask and would be happy to look into this. When I sort of lost touch, it was in the order of one nanometer. Yeah. But I don't think that was a fundamental limit. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of it might be how sort of how high a spatial frequency of thermal actuators uh, could you have? Mm -hmm. Because uh, it's one thing to get two points far apart and get average, but you really need to have accurate overlay precision everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so I think the real answer isn't just how accurate between two points, but how well can you do it over a complete 12 inch diameter wafer? Yeah. The advantage of what we were doing and why it was an attractive to nano imprint was because the problem with nano imprint was that it was slow. You had to keep the two things in contact for about a minute um, mm -hmm. for the thing to work. And so you, to make that economically feasible, you had to get accurate overlay over the whole 12 inch wafer at once. Mm -hmm. That's what made it attractive to Canon. Mm -hmm. I, I can find out from the folks at Molecular Imprints yeah. or Canon uh, what the latest numbers are. So that's one of my homework assignments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I just wanted to uh, dive into a little bit of that because sometimes you start with a simple idea like this and you end up with the frontiers of technology, uh, which is, you know, it's solving the same problem uh, that lithography companies are trying to solve for, you know, almost 50 years now. Uh, and there is, I mean, and again, I think I want to sort of mention the notion of the whole reason that the whole LIGO works. And if some of you look through majority of the work that went into making these uh, gravity observatories, which are the largest interferometers, is all in the mechanical design and it's all in the compliance mechanisms that reduce vibrations. And of course, this is the ultimate precision in my mind of what you end up achieving in these sets of very well-designed instruments. But you all start with the same sets of principles that go in in the most high-tech sets of machines are the same sets of principles that you can utilize in many of the instruments that you would want to build for completely new function. Uh, so I think this was a prelude towards, and one of the threads that we will do as an assignment when you're thinking about this, uh, I'll describe the assignment for this week, uh, is going to really be about when you're thinking about building and designing a compliant mechanism, you really also have to be thinking about these ideas around precision and whether precision is really what you're after or not in those sets of designs. Uh, so I'm going to switch a little bit of topics to tell you one more place that I strongly believe uh, uh, compliant mechanisms could play a role. And now this is an example of something uh, that you know as yet uh, doesn't exist, uh, but is something that uh, uh, you know can exist. Uh, and this is really around uh, the context of uh, design for prosthetics. And some of you might actually be involved in this field with the uh, excitement in 3D printing combined with prosthetics. But I want to tell a slightly more humbling story and also just a, a large challenge that still remains in this perspective. Uh, and before I do that, actually, no, yeah, maybe we will end with uh, voice coils in the very end. So yeah, let's cover this and we will come back to uh, voice coils. Uh, so I think the, the thread associated with and the, uh, the idea of uh, being able to make uh, structures that can move uh, from a perspective of thinking about you know, the human body itself, this is still one of the, uh, I mean, one of the biggest open challenges in frugal science in my mind. Uh, which is the perspective of building prosthetics that are affordable. Uh, and the one entity that has done the most amount of work in this space is Jaipur Foot. Uh, and since many of you are from India, you might know this uh, word uh, as a fairly common phrase. Uh, it's by all metrics in terms of number of uh, folks that uh, Jaipur Foot enables, uh, we by every measure, you can think of it as the world's largest organization for the disabled. Uh, 
Uh, they got their start by building a rubber-like compliant foot uh, that had both the, the mechanical properties, but most importantly, also the look and feel uh, that these sets of things could actually be acceptable. Because I think one thing that I will describe very soon as a challenge is the social acceptability uh, is an extremely important aspect of design in this scenario. And uh, this is a story I want to tell because it's uh, linked to Stanford itself. And Armand, uh, I'd requested him uh, to join in, uh, who is uh, one of the folks who's been, uh, we're having conversations with for a long while on this problem. He couldn't join, but I have his slide deck. So I'll just share a few pictures from him of the history of frugal science in the context of prosthetic design from a Stanford perspective and uh, a new challenge that we all could possibly tackle. Uh, so this is around remotion or the Jaipur knee. Once a uh, Jaipur foot had created the foot, of course, the next thing that they started looking at uh, was the knee. And uh, this started as a class project in a biomedical design class at Stanford. Uh, and then ended up now being a large scale entity that is trying to scale up this knee. Uh, and I think many of the folks are involved, but Krista Donaldson at DREV and of course Armand uh, on the side of now what I'll talk about on the uh, hand perspective and of course collaboration with Japanese. Uh, uh, and the challenge is a fairly simple one, which is just the fact that 95 percent of people still lack uh, prosthetic devices. Uh, and much of that is driven by cost. So, you know, and again, with healthcare coverage, some of these costs could be mitigated, but without that, it's almost impossible because the price tag for many of these devices can go down to, you know, 8,000, 50,000, of course, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the question at that time that they addressed almost a decade ago at this point, this project started around 2008, uh, was how to do this for uh, knees. Uh, and one of the threads is when you look at the scale of the need of the problem uh, that we're dealing with, we are roughly talking about you know, 10 million or so people that need these sets of uh, devices. Uh, and hence the perspective of large scale manufacturing being one of the criteria. Of course, there is a lot that goes on beyond the tool itself, which is how do you fit these things uh, on people? And this is exactly where a partnership way, say with an organization like Jep or Foot, who has uh, an entire system in place to be able to bring people over a short period of time, very rapidly fit them with the prosthetics and have them go back to their normal life in, I mean, remarkable, just less than a day or two sometimes. So this, is, this ended up being a collaboration between the two groups. Um, and here is the, what had existed before in the space of cost versus performance. I really like this image because it kind of both shows, there was prior work that had been done, which was associated with a single axis knee, which is the simplest thing you can imagine. If you were to really not think about the design of a knee, you can think of it as a single hinge point. And if you think of it as a single hinge point, you will imagine that when you are walking for your leg to swing back, you would have to lift your leg up for it to not hit the ground. And that is incredibly difficult and it's incredibly difficult to walk. And again, you know, for the sets of folks uh, who wear these types of artificial knees, uh, this was the only solution that was available. And then on the other hand, of course, there are lots of knees uh, and one of the key design elements of what is called a polycentric knee in which there is a four bar mechanism and it changes the uh, center of rotation. And it also has this kind of a folding that happens which swings the leg backwards. So one way of thinking about this is when you are walking, you can imagine a situation that uh, when you move your swing your leg uh, forward, you want to make sure that this does not snap on. And uh, that needs to happen naturally. Uh, and this is what the mechanical compliance of the knee does, where you don't have to think about how you move your upper limb to be able to cause that to happen. So this was solved by many of these designs. These are called polycentric designs 
where the hinges are such that there is a center of rotation, uh, but on the other hand, there is also a folding mechanism in which when the knee is coming back, it's, uh, it swings and hence the distance between the top to the bottom reduces. Uh, the challenge was uh, how do you build and manufacture this? And there is a kind of, of course, a mechanical insight. Uh, you can see if you were given this design, you can start thinking about how to manufacture these uh, at a lower cost when the primary cost for these ranged around you know, thousands of dollars. Uh, and there are two really key ideas that I like, and Joel was one of the students that worked on this project in a classroom. Uh, and then of course, uh, this ended up scaling up. Uh, there was two aspects. One was making a polycentric design to be manufacturable. And you know, this is, I think, I want to emphasize this idea that this is, Jaipur knee is not a new idea. They're technologically, it is the same design as the polycentric design, but most polycentric designs in the past could not be manufactured at large scale when we are talking about literally tens of millions of these to be manufactured globally. So the insight when you're thinking about your projects, you have to be thinking about what is the key barrier and the key barrier might not be in the design for that matter. And sometimes often enough, we, as we gravitate towards an idea and rethinking it as a, the key idea was the materials and the fact that this was built out of just very simple molded parts. And then of course, uh, lubrication. And I think this I really like uh, because this was done with uh, polymers uh, that naturally have an oil filling. And so they're self-lubricated polymers. And it was the self-friction between them that requires the need to not make a sound, which is as a user, you can imagine why something like that would be important. So another criteria when you are thinking about these sets of situations and scenarios that if you did not capture that in your requirement as a key requirement, you could have easily missed on the notion uh, that you know, self-lubrication might be a very valuable asset. And then this leads to the choice of material and the choice of manufacturing. So where Jaipur Ni is, this was roughly 10 years ago. This is where they are now. Uh, this is starting to scale. This is also an humbling experience for everybody involved in this because it takes this long. I mean, this journey is by itself around 10 years even for a need that is so large. And this is the reality also for designing at scale and designing for a frugal context that time, it, it still takes time, even with ideas and all the sets of partnerships and everything, it still takes time to truly get to where you want to go. And I think this is another lesson I want to emphasize for many people that in the end, we will be working on sets of projects, but it really is the long-term commitment for those projects that would lead to an implementation for that matter. Uh, and the space uh, that I find is, uh, and the key insight there was that there is a cost gap and a function gap between a single hinge versus this polycentric design, slightly more number of parts, but not a very large number of parts, a completely new redesign of a material, uh, and then of course, uh, the sense of partnership. Uh, so, you know, this is a video from 2008 that Arman shared with me. This was the first time uh, the Stanford student team from the uh, biomechanics class had gone to Jaipur, and this was a video that they filmed. Uh, within two days, uh, they, ah, this video is choppy. Uh, I will let it load again and play. And I think, you know, this is another important aspect that we have in our teams. I'll just drag it to see whether that plays. Let's try it one more time. Okay, a little bit better. Uh, yeah, I think I really want you to pay attention to the gate. And for that, the video has to play. Ah. Okay, I will share this video uh, because I think uh, it's also a, yeah. Uh, it's a moment of pride, both from a team perspective itself, but also the kind of feedback that you need for many times uh, projects like these on an immediate basis. 
Uh, and at that same time, uh, the kind of user feedback that you need to collect in many of the problems that you're working on. And so as you're thinking about your idea boards, this is why I said who the client or the audience is, because if you cannot directly talk to them, uh, you might take too long a time before somebody says that something is not right. And that's, that's really actually important. Uh, so building on this, the problem that I wanted to mention, which I feel uh, compliant mechanisms are uniquely suited to solve is along the side of, uh, now of course, a lot of work has been done on the foot, a lot of work has been done on the knee, uh, but very little has actually been done on uh, hands and prosthetic hands uh, from a functional perspective and cost perspective. Uh, so first of all, uh, this is, the problem has been brought by Arman, uh, who's been working on this problem for a long while. Uh, and I think one of the perspectives here is, is that the same set of design philosophy that you can apply to the knee, uh, the key being functionality. Uh, can you apply that to an upper limb? Uh, and of course, you know, upper limbs are definitely smaller in the total number of uh, prosthetic needs uh, than the lower limbs, but it's still a fairly large number. Um, and uh, I think I'm also going to mention something that has been happening in the 3D printing community, which is quite remarkable, and many of you might actually be part of this, uh, has been this enabling community in which several open source designs of uh, prosthetic hands specifically with the closure mechanisms have been shared very broadly. Uh, this led to a fairly completely community-driven projects. And I'm wondering whether if any of you might have actually even printed these in your maker labs before. Uh, and it's a fairly complex sets of parts, but you can assemble them, you can put them together. Uh, and then for many a times, if you have some amount of movement uh, available with a single string, a single degree of freedom, you can close all the fingers and open them together. Uh, and this has really been one of the designs that the open source community has been pioneering and playing with. Uh, on the other hand, what is truly useful in the community is actually a much older design, uh, which is, uh, it's essentially a harness. And one of the perspectives of the history is, uh, is a movable hook. And the thing that you see here is, uh, maybe I'll zoom in in here for a second. Um, so this design dates all the way back to 1912. And it's still in the world of hand prosthetics, the, uh, the most useful hand that's out there. And I think you, know, you have to measure this criteria of what is useful. Sometimes what looks like fingers and has all the degree of freedom might not be as useful because the useful is defined by the criteria of what you can do with it. And this design built by Dorrance in 1912 uh, really is something that still remains the, the gold standard in my mind. And what you're looking at is essentially two hooks with an elastic band, hence a closure force, and there is a degree of freedom here that as you move these, these hooks separate apart, that's it. And then of course there is a curve to be able to handle things. And then with this body prosthetics, what is done is by moving your arm, the chest in a manner, you can tug on on this wire that allows you to open. So no sensing capabilities, uh, no, uh, uh, you know, no, requirements associated with any uh, degrees of freedom needed. So this is really for amputees that might have uh, amputation all the way from the arm itself uh, and is the most, I think, uh, the most used prosthetics. Uh, it's still expensive to an extent where somebody in India, for example, and an average person somewhere around the world uh, might not be able to afford this. Uh, Jaipur Foot did a lot of sort of surveys in the cost that people can afford with the kinds of uh, schemes that they have built uh, in India around uh, loans and donations. 
I think the target cost for something like this needs to be around $50 or something for it to really be. I think Jeopardy, the first target cost was somewhere around $40 and they, they hit the mark in their first scenarios. So I find this as a, both as a remarkable problem and I also feel that it's still open because you know in the end, I just did a search for this and uh, this was roughly the cost of uh, what I could find. Uh, and what I hear from Arman, uh, one of the challenges, and I think at a later time, and if some teams build around this problem or in prosthetics, I'll have him speak to those teams. What he described was, although this is useful, uh, it's not socially acceptable. <laughs> and that is the challenge that we face, that by design, by all functions, nothing that has been built beats this, but it's not socially acceptable. And I think here lies another challenge that I want you to be thinking about when you're thinking about your frugal science designs is that it's perfectly okay that you can build and design something that from a functional perspective is meeting the criteria, but if it does not get the level of acceptance in a societal context, which was the key lesson that the Jepperfoot learned. Uh, the primary reason for their success was their legs kind of looked like legs where then the first glance, you wouldn't immediately know that, oh, this person was an amputee. And I think this is why they're excited about exploring this set of a notion of how do you do something like that in this space? Uh, there have been other approaches, for example, the approaches taken by many uh, prosthetic companies have been the complete opposite for the design to stand out so much that you would be proud of that design and wear it from a socially accepted perspective, where you would be looking at, I think, if you check the site, for example, the most common, uh, a prosthetic company that's growing in Europe, Open Bionics, most of their arms really look like from the movies and are directly inspired by the movies uh, to try to bring this notion that, you know, in the end, uh, acceptance, uh, we have to build that in society per se. So I wanted to, mention this challenge because if somebody is interested, it would be valuable to put together an idea board on this. But in the light of compliant mechanisms, uh, you know, what are monolithic structures that could be built in design that can be manufactured at large scale that provide the level of functionalities and degrees of freedom that don't have so many parts and are amenable to mass manufacturing? You know, so not just 3D printing, but far beyond 3D printing. And I think that still remains an open challenge. Uh, primarily, uh, I think, you know, it's, it's not about the fact that there is nothing fundamental about this as an issue, other than the fact that this has to be sort of designed differently. So if anybody is interested in prosthetics, this would be a phenomenal challenge uh, for folks to take. And then at some point of time, I'll have Arman also come and share sort of the groundwork uh, and contacts with Jep or Foot, because with a project like this, I think it's extremely valuable and important to really work with an on the ground organization. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say about prosthetics. Uh, I want to end with a quick demo of another compliant mechanism that you're all using, but which is connected to the assignment for the class. Uh, so, the assignment for this week is going to be, uh, you have to make something that moves. Uh, and I am going to define a little bit of some criteria around it, but you know, in the end you get to just, you get to make something that moves on its own. Uh, that's, that's all that I'm gonna say. You can take it in any way and form. You can think of any kind of energy associated with this. You will beg and borrow from some of the things that we have covered in, folding in paper and compliant mechanisms, uh, but you get to choose uh, what you would like to build. Uh, but I want to end with uh, an object that you've all played with that is a remarkable compliant mechanism, which is our earbuds. So let me share this for a second. So if you happen to have some earbuds, uh, I was quite surprised when I first took my first flight that somebody gave me free earbuds. I was like, oh, how is that possible? I actually kept those. And then every time that I would take another flight, they would give me another earbud until I realized that they're actually pretty cheap. Uh, 
but how come uh, that these earbuds uh, and how they're manufactured are so simple and cheap? And I'm gonna show you a quick sort of a demo with this. So first of all, if you have some old earbuds, uh, I would highly recommend you break them and you would find a couple of components in there. Uh, so first of all is a diaphragm that you can see, and this is the compliant mechanism. If you notice carefully, it is folded and rippled in a manner that it gives a preferential degree of freedom to the movement. But then there is a very fine coil attached. So right there is the compliant mechanism. I don't know if some of you can see that little plastic with some ripples on the side. You can think about many different ways that you could design this. And then right next to it is this coil. And of course, behind it is, is a magnet. And we can do a quick demo if we want. So I'm going to play some uh, music on my computer and uh, uh, if I go on YouTube and just type music I assume something uh, worthwhile will play. Uh, okay let's do the uh, Hamilton for that matter and I just want to of course we will have to listen to an ad first, but I want to do a quick demo just for if some of you have not played with these before. Uh, can you still hear me? Okay, so because I can't hear you at this point, I've plugged in something in here. Um, I'm going to be playing a music and you would notice that if you watch these diaphragm, you won't see a thing. And of course, this is primarily because the displacements associated with what you're playing are fairly low. So if you want to see these displacements, what we're going to do is make a setup here with a tiny laser. We will point this. So let me just play the music first. Uh, and at this point, uh, I don't know if you all can hear that music. Probably not. And uh, I'm gonna skip the ad so we can actually get to uh, what I'm doing is, okay, so yeah, I have something here and the simplest way to know that your compliant mechanism is actually moving, of course, it's moving very, very small. Uh, I'm just going to shine a very quick, this is just an optical lever and we're going to move, uh, the camera to a point where we can see the wall. So I'm trying to align the, uh, the membrane in a manner that I can get a reflection out of it. And when you would play something like that, so now let's go back to the, so I will, so this is what I've done so far. I just have a laser pointer. I have this membrane and I've just made an optical liver to see whether I can watch these vibrations. And one of the threads that we will do is now if I play something, for example, uh, And it's a really fun experiment to do because of course, if some of you have not seen uh, sound, uh, it's the easiest way to do. And uh, all you have to do is just set something like that up. And it's very hard to see, uh, I think the contrast in this is fairly low, but on my end, I can see these uh, little ripples that come from the curvature of that compliant membrane move as uh, the speaker is talking. So try playing with this. And one of the threads that would be useful is the reason I wanted to bring up and mention uh, I was playing Hamilton to that speaker. Uh, and so the reason I brought this up and the reason I find this intriguing and part of the assignment if some of you want to think about it it is an example where the actual actuator is already embedded 
on a compliant substrate. So you can start imagining that rather than just having actuators that are monolithic, you can think about many of these coils. And the simplest way to see this is in the scenario for how these compliant coils are made, for example. So for most of the time, when you have, I'm just gonna share my screen here. Uh, many of the voice coils, the way they are manufactured and the reason this object is uh, so cheap is you should all watch this video of how headphones are made. Uh, there has been a membrane has been made here. She applies a bit of glue to the diaphragm. That's the voice coil right there. Voice coil in an assembly device. She aligns the glued section of the diaphragm with the coil. Ultraviolet light activates the glue to seal the coil to the diaphragm. The plastic housings each contain a magnet. So what just happened there was on a compliant structure, an actuator has actually been applied. And so now depending on if there is a series of magnets that are stationary, you can get movement and actuation associated with a compliant structure. And of course, this is done in a robotic manner at very large scale. But so far, I have not seen that many, uh, you know, integrated and embedded voice coil structures in compliant mechanism. And of course, the tricky part here is uh, there is, of course, a limit associated with the travel distances for voice coils. And thinking about can you uh, imagine using some very, very voice coils are trivial to make because they're just electromagnets. Uh, the part of this assignment will be is can you imagine any of your favorite actuator? It doesn't have to be voice coil. I think voice coils are very interesting in what they're able to do. Uh, I was looking through the numbers for the acceleration, for example. Uh, you can accelerate a voice coil if you design it correctly all the way to around 800 meters per second square. So that's 80 G in accelerations that you can get just primarily depending on uh, how you design it. Uh, so there is a lot of potential of using voice coils. They are the ones that drive most of your optics on your cameras. When you got the focus features, they're all driven by voice coils. They're a remarkable actuator and they possibly, at least for lightweight applications, have a huge potential. So the assignment will be is make something uh, with what we have learned so far, but it has to move on its own, even though if it moves for a short time, but it really has to move on its own. That's the, you can choose any energy source that you care about. Uh, you can light up your mechanism on fire and while it's burning, it's moving. Whatever energy source you want to choose, uh, but the goal is to be creative and think a little bit about the sets of things that uh, we have actually uh, learned in the past as well. Uh, so I think it's 1.53. Uh, we're gonna open up to questions slash discussions uh, and we will end the official format for the, uh, the class. Uh, and the thread that we will follow up on the logistics side would be is on Wednesday, uh, which is tomorrow. Uh, we will hold uh, one more design session for helping folks that have not found a team and need help and guidance. And then after this Friday, we will set up a Discord channel. And for maybe we can start, Tyler, by setting Discord channels for individual teams that are already well formed so that you all have sounds perfect. for brainstorming as well. So I'll end here. If there are any questions, uh, we will all stay and we can catch up. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I know many of you connect from fairly late hours uh, of the evenings so you don't have to uh, but yes. we'll... and, and the most important thing though is to put your name on a team sorry yes. yeah the most important thing is to put your name on a team but um and that's going to be on on notion um but once you do that yes that's the main thing yeah and i see a, a comment from rico on the cad class i think the class that i am going to teach will be on compliant uh mechanism design and maybe what my proposal would be is I could do that tomorrow and then move this design session to a uh, Friday. Uh, so if people find it useful, why don't I just do that? I will try putting together 
an hour session on compliant mechanism design. But I won't be able to cover basics of CAD. So I'll cover much more of the theory around compliant mechanism and practice of compliant mechanism design. And somebody, uh, I don't know if that has already happened, uh, but it would be valuable if somebody runs a, a simple teach me anything session on just CAD tools, common CAD tools. I think there's so many common CAD tools that are available. It's almost a second form of drawing. And uh, there's so much talent in this room. So if any of you want to teach that, uh, I was thinking it might be useful to do the compliant mechanism design after the CAD session. But since the assignment, some of you, I want you to be thinking about compliant mechanism. Let's do a session on tomorrow on the mechanism design side of the story. You don't need to know CAD to be able to come to the design session. You can literally take a piece of paper and cut and cardboards and plastic and hand machine anything if you're interested. So you don't need that. Uh, but I think if some people are running sessions on uh, CAD, uh, we can align them as well. Uh, I think we will run the, the session on compliant mechanism at the same time. Tyler, what was the time that we do? And this time we will record these Teach Me Anything sessions as well. Yes, and we'll, we'll put all this information on the announcements channel, so monitor that. Um, I believe it was 4 p.m. Pacific, but um, I'll add it to the calendar, the course calendar as well. So just take a look at the course calendar um, and, and everything should be there. If you can't attend in person, you wouldn't have missed anything. We will still do this as a video recording as well. That's right. Yeah. Uh, any other questions on uh, the sets of things that we discussed, especially if some of you have experience in prosthetic design, I would love to hear your thoughts or if any of you have been engaged in prosthetic design as well in the past or have been engaged with the enable the future community side of that project too. Um, I'm not seeing any hands. Shiva, did you mean that you have been engaged or? Okay, I'm seeing several hands actually. So yeah, I'm curious if some of you want to comment on the sets of challenges that you have faced in the, in the collision between frugal science and prosthetics. Uh, Prabhu, do you want to say something about it? Uh, Tyler, if you unmute Prabhu, I'm hearing Prabhu's hand and then I'm seeing Jacob also. Uh, there may be some residual hands also from earlier. Oh, these are residual hands. Okay. <laughs> from the past. Yeah. Uh, are these... Uh, maybe somebody on the chat can mention if they want to say a word about uh, their past experiences. And okay, I think I they're all residual hands. Um, okay, yeah, I think any other questions, if people might have questions in the chat. Um, and then I think in terms of logistics, the next case study will be around environmental monitoring. So we'll switch from really mechanics heavy to biology heavy now, and then we'll come back to optics in the very end. Uh, so I think, yeah, just from a perspective, I'll share that somewhere on Discord, but then the next two case studies, we will choose to be both uh, monitoring and measuring biology, uh, for example. Uh, any questions? Uh, uh, one quick thing, just for the sake of the recording, um, I could show people how to use the course calendar if that's relevant. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen super quick. Um, so here is what Notion should generally look like. Um, I'm on the idea board right now. Um, I've added this new thing called course calendar, which uh, if my computer would respond to me. Uh, should be here on the left. All right, let's, okay, there we go. We're loading it. Um, so here, this is under the frugal science main page. You can find this and it will have the Google calendars embedded here, which you can see. Um, and if you want to add this to your actual main calendar um, on discord, there is the link, which I've left pinned in the announcements channel. Um, and that, that link should allow you to just join that calendar and um, get all the notifications for it. So for, you know, 
basically, you know, there are some teach me anything. I'll, I'll schedule the design session as well in here. Um, so you should be able to find all of this on the notion page. And then Tyler, do you add those manually or do people, when they create an event, they add that? Uh, I'm adding them manually okay. for now. I think it's just cleaner, um, yeah. but feel free if you have anything, just DM me on discord and I'll add that to the calendar. Yeah, I think especially for the teach me anything sessions, any feedback on the teach me anything sessions. First of all, thank you for the folks who did already. I'm curious for the folks who attended. Uh, and uh, as a feature, I definitely want to continue that because this would give other people just opportunity to teach things. Um, and any logistics on those sessions, if people want to uh, give feedback on would be very valuable. I'm seeing a question from Shiva on thinking about understanding the usability as an example for Jepper foot knee, curious how long it took to validate the designs in terms of acceptability for the users. What were some of the early challenges during the process? So from what I've heard from Armand and Krista, one of the factors there was uh, associated with getting first quick feedback on um, users' capacity and capability to perform the sets of actions and the fact that uh, you know Jepperfoot happened to have a uh, open design space where things can be built, prototype, where patients are coming in all the time and an incredible interaction with the patients that are willing to provide feedback to new ideas. I think it is not just a transactionary relationship when you are building and designing for somebody. You want to co-design with them and then Jepperfoot happened to have that uh, philosophy from the beginning because they used to get feedback from their users all the time. So, you know, I think in some sense that was smooth. The challenge of a knee is not so hard as the hand because the knee is not visible. Foot is visible and the hand is visible. So I think uh, in some sense on the acceptance level, the acceptance was very high because these folks could do things previously that were unimaginable and do them in a manner that uh, allowed them much more natural movements and hence, uh, you know, they could go on and live a normal life. So I think the, the knee, in my point, the acceptability issue that comes in prosthetics for hands is that the hand is really uh, a very visible, uh, it's a very visible uh, situation that you have to sort of be thinking about. And then hence the multiple approaches that people take of really making it standing out or trying to blend it. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I think I, Ferris had a really good point. I really wanted to, the whole point of today's class was I just wanna mention that these are fairly complex issues and uh, we should embrace that complexity and not be scared of it. And on the other hand, hopefully, uh, when you do something, it reveals another aspect, you know, even in failure, it reveals another, when you will come up with a design that you think is one of the best things in the world and nobody uses it, you would have learned something. Uh, so on that note, it's two o'clock. We'll say bye to everybody. Thank you for all the students and all the mentors that joined again. Uh, one of the threads that's very valuable is, uh, the discussions on Discord, the number of ideas are just absolutely incredible. So for folks who are not using Discord, try playing with it. Uh, even if you are overwhelmed, there are nuggets of just brilliance hidden in those conversations. Uh, I mean, you know, you can spend an infinite amount of time on those conversations. So uh, try to engage. I think that's really where most of the learning will happen as we start transitioning into uh, uh, project design. So on that note, bye everybody. I'll run the session tomorrow on compliant mechanism that will be announced on Discord, but then we will see you on Thursday. Bye, Patrick. <laughs>